Hey guys! Today we're solving problems with position and force vectors directed along lines in 3D space. We'll be in our right-handed 3D Cartesian coordinate system, which we learned about last time. Let's start by learning about position vectors. They are Cartesian vectors that locate where one point in space is relative to another point. We have points A and B, and we want to describe where they are relative to each other. First, we identify the sense, i.e. if we're going from A to B or from B to A. Let's say we're going from A to B. We look at each of the three primary directions one at a time to describe where B is relative to A. In the x direction, at b, we are at x equals 0, and at a, we are at x equals negative 7. Simplifying, that means that going from a to b, we have moved 7 meters in the positive x direction. We do the same thing for the y and z directions. From A to B, we move 7 in the positive x direction, 5 in the negative y direction, and 4 in the positive z direction. This is our position vector, describing where B is relative to A. Now, let's say we have a force of 500 kilonewtons acting in the same direction as our vector. What would our force vector be? The force vector is different than the position vector. The position vector is defined by our displacements in meters, whereas our force is in kilonewtons. But the two vectors do share the same direction. To bridge the two types of vectors, can you think of a unitless way that we can describe the direction of vectors within a 3D Cartesian space? 10 points if you guessed unit vectors. Our force and position vectors will have the same unit vector. If we find our unit vector, we can multiply it by our force magnitude, and we end up with our force as a Cartesian vector. Let's find our unit vector. To do that, we divide each of our position vector components by the magnitude of our position vector. We get the square root of 90. That means our unit vector is and all of our units will cancel. So to the nearest three decimals, here is our unit vector. Since our force and position vectors have the same unit vector, that means that this is also true and can be rearranged as Now we can use our 500 kilonewton force magnitude to expand this. Et voila, this is our force vector acting in this direction. Our unit vector can also be used to solve for our coordinate direction angles. These are measured between our vector's direction and the positive axes of a localized coordinate system at our vector's head. Let's practice with three more problems. A dog is playing tug of war with a bone that is held in place at point P at coordinate 001. He pulls with a rope that is 4 feet long. As a Cartesian vector, the dog exerts a force of 50 pounds in the x direction, 30 pounds in the negative y direction, and 60 pounds in the positive z direction. What are the coordinates of point Q at the other end of the rope? We want to go from a force vector to a position vector. How do we go between the two? We use their common unit vector. First, we find a unit vector in the direction of F. 
We use that to create a Cartesian position vector going from P to Q. Then we use that and the coordinates of point P to find the coordinates of point Q. Why don't you pause and give it a try on your own. To find the coordinates of point Q, the first thing we need to do is find our unit vector. That means we need the magnitude of our force vector. The magnitude is equal to the square root of the sum of each of our components, which in our case is the square root of 7,000. That gives us a unit vector of 2 nearest three decimal points, we get 0.5. Since our unit vector is going in the same direction as our rope from point P to Q, we can combine it with our rope length to give us our position vector. So multiplying each term by four feet, we get 0.5. I used one decimal place because I'm lazy, but you should use however many sig figs your prof asks for. Our position vector tells us where point Q is relative to point P. This says that from P to Q, we've moved 2.4 in the positive x direction. So finding the coordinates of Q, since we started at an x coordinate of zero and we've moved in the positive direction by 2.4, our x coordinate would be zero plus 2.4, which is 2.4. For our y coordinate, we started at a zero and we moved 1.4 feet in the negative y direction. Zero plus negative 1.4 gives us a negative 1.4 y coordinate. For our z coordinate, we've started at positive one and we moved 2.9 feet up. That means that our z coordinate would be equal to one plus 2.9 for a total of 3.9 feet. That's our answer. Great work, guys. An iron equilateral triangle is suspended by three ropes with equal length. Each rope has a force magnitude of 0.5 kilonewtons. This problem has three parts. First, express the force in each rope as a Cartesian vector. Then find the resultant force supporting the triangle. Lastly, find the coordinate direction angles of the resultant. This problem seems like a lot, but it's mostly just repetition. Excuse my rough little model here, but if you can believe it, I didn't actually have an iron equilateral triangle at home. So because all three sides of our triangle are the same length, and all of the three ropes also have the same length, when our system is suspended, our triangle should lay completely flat. And the top of our ropes should line up directly with the centroid of our shape. In our problem, the centroid is located at the origin of the coordinate system. So if we were to look down on our triangle, we would see the picture on the right. Since it's flat, we know each of our vertices will have a z-coordinate of zero. From here, we can use geometry to figure out our other vertex coordinates. Since the center of our triangle is at the origin, the distance from the centroid to each of the vertices should be the same. The distance from O to A is two meters. That means these distances are also two meters. The internal angles of an equilateral triangle are 60 degrees. So these angles would be half that at 30 degrees. Then with some basic math and symmetry, we fill in our vertex coordinates. What do we do after we found our vertices? So for each rope, we know two coordinates, the vertex of our triangle and the top of our ropes. These can be used to define the direction of our rope force. So using these two coordinates, we can develop a position vector, 
And from the position vector, we can create a unit vector that is in the direction of our force. Then, using our force magnitudes, we can combine that with our unit vector to determine our forces as force vectors. First, we find the position vectors for each rope, then their magnitudes. We were told in the problem statement that all three ropes had the same length, so we really only needed to calculate this once. Then divide each term by the length to get our unit vectors. These steps are getting repetitive, so using Excel could save you time. Just make sure you could do them by hand to quickly practice for a test. What do you think our next step is? Here's a hint. To get our force vector, we multiply our unit vectors by the force magnitude. Here's the force in rope DA and the ropes DB and DC. We could have skipped a few calculations if we had recognized at the beginning that the K components of all our force vectors should end up the same. That's because all our ropes are symmetric, ending over the centroid and they have the same force and length. Part B, the magnitude of the resultant force. Add the like components of our Cartesian vectors. Then take the square root of the sum of the squares. Just kidding, I'm lazy. Thanks to symmetry and equal forces, we know that the forces in the x and y direction will cancel each other. Our resultant force magnitude is 1.248 kilonewtons acting in the z direction. Last part, find the coordinate direction angles. We can do this the long way or the short way. The long way is to use our unit vector and actually calculate the arc cosines. The short way is to visualize our three angles. No number crunching needed. Congrats on slaying another problem. Let's do one more, then you can be free. A chimney is held in place by three cables. The forces in each cable acting on the chimney are given below. What are the magnitude and coordinate direction angles of the resultant force? This problem is a lot like the last one, except that a lot of the simplification possible in problem two won't work here. Our supports aren't symmetric. The cables are all different lengths and they all have different forces. But our fundamental steps are the same. Let's think backward. To get our coordinate direction angles, we'll want to use the unit vector of our resultant. To get that, we'll need our resultant force magnitude and our resultant force vector. To get our resultant force vector, we first need to get each cable force as a Cartesian force vector. And to do that, we would first need to describe the direction of each cable with a unit vector. To get our unit vectors, we would first need the position vectors for each cable. Got it? Try it on your own first, then follow along.
and we're done. Lots of writing and lots of calculating. Nice work today, guys. I hope you learned something and hope to see you back next time.